We join me in prayer. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this week I experienced one of the greatest barriers to generosity. Futility. Tuesday morning had gotten off to a really good start for me. I had good devotional time in the early morning and got into the office and got a lot of work done, a lot of projects finished up. And then just before lunch, I had a, a great CrossFit training session with Taryn and some of my colleagues. And then at 12.30, I had a haircut appointment. And it was during that very indulgent experience of having my hair shampooed and cut and blown dry and quaffed that the person who was cutting my hair mentioned that the owner of the salon, Heather Bates, had recently been diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer. I'd known Heather ever since I first came to Battle Creek, and it was just hard to phantom how such a young, vibrant, energetic young woman could be struck down with such a deadly disease. As I was paying for my haircut, I noticed that there was a, a stack of flyers on the counter with information about a fund that had been set up to help Heather's family during their battle with this disease. But I remember feeling so incredibly helpless to do anything of any consequence that I walked away without even picking up a flyer. As I left the building, I was going through my schedule for the day in my head, and I, I realized that I wasn't going to have enough time to make it home for dinner before my evening meeting. So I decided to save the lunch I brought and have it for dinner. And since I was right across the street from Past Pastrami Joe's, I decided I'd treat myself to a hot pastrami sandwich for lunch. So I picked up my sandwich and drove over to the church and as I pulled in the lot I was surprised to see that every parking spot was taken. So I went over to the east lot and when I came into the east entrance I saw that the courtyard was filled with people who had come for our food distribution. Once a month a team of people from our church pick up surplus food from the southwest Michigan Food Bank, and they bring it back here and distribute it from our courtyard. The room was filled with people who were trying to get some extra bread and whatever fresh produce they were able to pick up at the food bank just to stretch their household budgets enough that they'd be able to feed their families. And here I was walking through the room with my hot pastrami sandwich, bag of chips, and ice-cold Coca-Cola just for me. I tried to be as inconspicuous as possible as I walked past people who had been patiently waiting for hours for the food distribution, and I secluded myself in my office where I could eat in private, but I just couldn't enjoy my prized pastrami sandwich that day. The window in front of my desk looks out over the parking lot and there was this steady stream of weary people walking out with plastic bins and cardboard boxes with the few meager food items that we had to distribute that day. I have enough 
money to treat myself to lunch pretty much any time I want. And the folks that were walking past my window just barely had enough to get by. It wasn't really anything I could do about that at the moment, but it didn't leave me with much of an appetite for my hot pastrami sandwich. The next morning, Dave Schweitzer sent out an email saying that one of the bread lovers who buys the bread that David bakes in his wood-fired oven every Friday has a daughter who was recently diagnosed with a serious illness and would require a long, expensive series of treatments that would significantly alter her life. And David had decided to donate the proceeds from Friday's bread sale to support her family. It was a beautiful gesture on David's part, one that reflects his own generous and compassionate spirit. But instead of feeling good about the opportunity to contribute something to support a family in crisis, I found myself feeling overwhelmed. David's email reminded me of all the other people that I know about who are facing life-threatening challenges. Denise Jones's stepfather had a major stroke on Monday and was in the critical care unit up in Holland. Missy Sprouse had major surgery this week. Chris Chris was hospitalized right after his beautiful 85th Birthday celebration, Maria Patassin is starting radiation treatment for her cancer. There are so many people struggling with life-altering conditions that anything that I can do in response feels inadequate and insignificant. I don't have the financial resources to help everyone who stops at church looking for assistance with food or utility bills or transportation or rent. I don't have the ability to reverse disease processes or alleviate suffering. I can't fix the systemic problems of poverty and hunger that afflict the poor. And sometimes I get so preoccupied with the things that I cannot do that I dismiss the significance of what I can do. Sometimes my own sense of futility diminishes my capacity for generosity. That's why the parable that Jesus told about the mustard seed feels so important to me today. It's one of several stories in Matthew's gospel that draw contrasts between small beginnings and large results. A tiny seed becomes a large tree. A little yeast leavens three full measures of flour. Five loaves and two fish feed a crowd of 5,000 people with 12 baskets of leftovers. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed which someone took and sowed in the garden. It grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. What I love about that parable is that it reminds me of what I'm responsible for. My responsibility is not to single-handedly usher in the kingdom of God. My responsibility is not 
to provide habitat for the birds of the air. My responsibility is not to grow a mustard tree. My responsibility is to plant the seed. That's something I'm capable of doing. I can't do any of those other things. I can't make the seed germinate, sprout, grow, or develop into a mature tree. I can't turn the seed into nesting habitat for birds. But if I don't do what I can do, if I don't take responsibility for putting that seed in the ground, then none of those other things will ever happen. I can't make them happen, but I can prevent them from happening. It won't happen without my doing my part. Sometimes we get immobilized with a sense of futility. Sometimes we get so focused on what we can't do and all of the challenges that they seem unsurmountable. But the parable of the mustard seed reminds us of the importance of what we can do. I can't cure stage four leukemia, but I can express support for Heather by contributing what I have to her family's fund. I can't remove the pain or grief that people are going through as they face changing life challenges but I can accompany them in prayer and with my presence and offer my encouragement. I can't end hunger and poverty, but I can help satisfy more than just my own appetite. I can't make a mustard tree, but I can plant a seed. As people of faith, we plant our seeds trusting that God gives the growth. That's what moves us beyond futility to generosity. We know that we are not on our own. Everyone has a seed to plant. And we trust that God has the power to take our small contributions and transform them into something greater than we could ever imagine. In the region where Jesus lived, mustard was an invasive plant. It grew wild along the sides of the roads, and farmers had to be vigilant in pulling it out from their fields before it took over everything. But Jesus used that invasive quality as an example for illustrating how the kingdom of God spreads. Someone plants a single seed in the garden, and it takes off, and it grows like crazy until it's taken over the entire garden. Each mustard tree produces thousands of seeds every year, and some of those seeds will fall to the ground and germinate and sprout and grow and mature. And each of those trees will produce thousands 
of seeds every year and some of them will fall to the ground and germinate and sprout and grow and mature and each of those trees will produce thousands of seeds that will fall to the ground. All because someone planted one seed. During our pledge drive here at First Congregational Church, we've embraced this theme of love grows through generosity. It's an important pledge campaign for us because this year our operating budget will come in with a deficit somewhere around $90,000. We can't continue doing the ministry that we do much longer without closing that deficit. $90,000 is a big number. And it's easy to become immobilized with a sense of futility. There isn't a single person in our church with the resources to make up that difference for us. But we all have seeds to plant. I can't balance our budget, but I have enough to tithe the first tenth of my salary to this church. That's just a little over $7,000. Today, the rest of the church staff and all of the council leaders are turning in their pledges and they have seeds to plant. Next week, we'll distribute pledge cards to everyone in the church, and on November 9th, we'll invite everyone to plant their seeds during our one-body service at 11 o'clock. And afterwards, no matter how much was pledged, we will celebrate. Because as people of faith, we know that's all we have to do. We have to plant the seeds that we have in hand right now. And we trust that if we do our part, then God will bring the growth that will turn our small seeds into something larger than any of us can imagine. We plant our seeds trusting that love grows. That's how it is in the kingdom of God. Amen.